Malcolm, and thank, thanks uh, for inviting me. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm gonna, I've got a lot to talk about, and I'm going to rush fairly quickly through stuff on conservation planning, and then I'm going to talk a little about monitoring, some new stuff on monitoring. I'm a, I'm a bit bored with conservation planning. I've been doing it for too long. Um, and a lot of the things we've done, we're coming to the end of, and what we're most, or well, some of the things we're interested in now is um, monitoring stuff. A couple of things, uh, I, I think, just a segue from, from what Donna had to say, the EPBC Act is important. Did you know submissions to it closed on Monday? Uh, we need to support that act, we need to say something about it. I was a, uh, an advisor to the, the review, and the review's in the middle of its process. There will be some more comment time if you want to, and you shouldn't underestimate the importance of that act for a lot of the things that we do. And I know we complain and whinge about the lack of progress on marine reserves in Australia. There's not enough, they're too slow, but I think Donna's right. Uh, on a global scene, we're superstars. If you go anywhere overseas, uh, and ask them about marine reserves, they look to us. They look at the rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef as the gold star of global rezoning. It's the pretty well the only large systematically designed marine reserve system in, in the planet. Uh, so that's good. And, and I might also add, and it's politically stupid for me to say this, but the person who really drove a lot of this through was Senator Hill. We spoke to him in the mid-1990s and said, your legacy to the world would be getting Australia's marine reserve system sorted out. And I think he, would, he, he probably hoped that some of it would happen while he was still there. He was our longest standing ever environment minister. Pretty well nothing happened while he was still environment minister, but almost all the things that he set in place eventually happened, uh, often through the coalition, but now through the Labor Party. So he was envisaging these rezonings happening much faster than they did. They're always slow, but he, he fought long and hard uh, in, in when he was uh, environment minister for over five years to get all these things to happen. And I think we usually forget that because new ministers open and close things and take the credit for them, but he was the person who decided that everything had to happen. Um, and I can't get any political brownie points out of that because they're out of office and you know, they may never be back office again, as far as I can tell. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk about Mark Sanders' stuff, but in a sense I'm going to talk a bit about conservation planning and uh, Mark Sands has been used all over the world to build marine reserve systems. It's used by, by the Commonwealth to advise them and inform them about their rezonings all around the country as we speak. Um, but in a sense, the most important thing about conservation planning and Mark Sands is that there is a mathematical problem behind it. And I find that 99% of conservation and environmental problems in the world are solved and nobody wrote them down. I don't even know what the problem is. It might be something a bit... Well, and I don't count let's save as much biodiversity as possible as a problem. That's not a problem definition. Problem definition has to be quantitative. And once it's quantitative, you can use decision sciences to solve it. And we very rarely do that, but luckily in conservation planning, we do. And the good thing about it is that in conservation planning, it's quite simple, and people like Bob Pressey, Doug Cox, Chris Margules, Nick Nichols, all these Australians, uh, uh, basically formulated the conservation planning problem in the early 1980s. The first formal statement was 1989, 20 years ago. We had taken one bit of conservation science and we'd wrote, written down the problem properly. And why did we have to write the problem down properly? And uh, as was Bob was saying this before any of us were born, well, it's not, he's not here now, so I can abuse him. Be, be, he would have been speaking probably if, if he was well, but um, he showed this diagram many times. This is a bit of Australia. It doesn't really matter what bit of Australia it is. I think it's northeast of New South Wales. And this is the reserve system, the percentage of the reserve system, and this is infertile soils, moderately fertile soils, very fertile soils. This is low slope, moderate slope, high slope. And if you look at almost anywhere in the planet, I was just in Hong Kong, 40% of Hong Kong, it's got five and a half million people in it, 40% of it's a reserve. It's all steep, okay? This is what happens if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a problem. You just grab all the crap that nobody else wants and make it a reserve. Fortunately, in the marine system, we didn't have hardly any reserves. Uh, but, and so we actually, in some senses, have an open slate, and a lot of the rezoning that's gone on, particularly the Great Barrier Reef rezoning, was very much based on, rather than getting an outcome like that, where the things that nobody wanted were well conserved, 
and the things, that, the ecosystems that were heavily used, this would be coastal sort of ecosystems particularly, were massively underrepresented. We do know of the 70 bioregions identified in the Great Barrier Reef rezoning, I think they all got to 20% except maybe one got to 19.8. So if you put uh, all the different habitat features and ordinations of the Great Barrier Reef on a diagram like this and look at percentage coverage, you will get a relatively flat outcome, which is a massive advance from what we've been doing in the past. And so that's good. There's millions of pieces of things you can do. And in a sense, people say, oh, this is very confusing and the software's confusing and look at all the hard maths. I'm here to say to you, I'm sick of people telling me the maths is hard. What is the conservation planning problem? There's information about things that you like and can cuddle or watch and there's places and the game is simple. Get me the smallest, the cheapest number of places, the smallest number of places to cover the things I like to some level of adequacy. So that's the problem I use on first years, second years, third years and senior bureaucrats, anybody really. And, and well, grade five students. I say find me the set of sites that will conserve all of those species, assuming they all cost the same amount and they struggle around and eventually they realise the answer is two sites and it's C and E. So it's not quite simple. All the Great Barrier Reef rezoning was, not quite all, but the principles are, instead of having eight, ten sites, we had 17 or so thousand sites and along the other side we have 250 or more features. And it's the same problem, that's it. No more complicated. There's software and they call it a black box, but if you can't get that, I don't know what you can get, there is a mathematical problem that solves that. And it's three lines. And if you can multiply and you know what that funny thing is, then you know it. If you don't know enough maths to know what that funny thing is and you can't multiply, then um, go and get an undergraduate degree. Um, you did it in year 12. That is the problem of conservation planning. That is what Mark Sand does. That is what C plan or any other need, I don't really care what piece of software you use. And you know, all it does, people say, this is terrible, this is so hard, how can I explain it to everybody? What do you do? Get me a certain amount of every feature I care about for the minimum cost to everybody else in a reasonably compact shape. It's it. Done. Finished. No more. That's why I don't need to talk about it for very long, because it's so ridiculously simple. For the minimum cost to everybody else, you I mean, you can argue about all, talk about all those things. That's it. And I always say, what is cost? It's how many letters get written when you rezone something green. That's cost. <laughs> what does Mark Sand do that it didn't used to do before? It continues to develop with the support of various people, in, particularly the Commonwealth Government's uh, Commonwealth Environmental Research Facility. And now we can zone. Originally it was just green and white. The world is not just green and white. There's lots of pretty colours and the rezoning clearly wasn't just green and white. And now the new version of Mark Sand, Mark Sand with Zones does that. Uh, we can also deal with connectivity, so if you want to maximise connectivity for a range of species, you can do that inside Mark Sand, the formulation is slightly different, and you can deal with catastrophes. So if you know the risks of coral bleaching to a whole range of reefs, these are things we couldn't do in 2002 and 3 and 4 when Leanne and others were fiddling around with Mark Sand. Um, you can now uh, deal with catastrophes and factor it into, into your decision making when you decide which places should be rezoned and which places should not be rezoned, or which places should be green and which places shouldn't be green. So that is a bit of the map, and um, why is it nothing happened? Uh, Mark Sand with Zone now does that, um, and basically now you can have as many different colours as you like on the map, and it, the kind of people who do these are foresters, so it's similar sort of stuff to foresters. And interesting, it still solves a well-defined mathematical problem, it's a bit more complicated, a bit more messy, but it can still be written on a page, and you can now set targets for resource users. If you are determined that a particular user, whatever users they are, are not allowed to use more than a certain fraction of their existing resource, then you can set that as a target as well, which um, certainly enables us to do a number of things, that, and, and several, several people in this room are familiar with that sort of concept and problem and we can get it to run. This is a very small scale example which Ron Stewart from Western Australia and, and others in the group have been working on uh, Rottnest around Rottnest Island. And this is actually all a marine reserve originally but when we've just been fiddling with the zoning and you can actually get it so the full highly protected areas are tend to be buffered by the less protected areas. Bearing in mind of course that output from software is just decision support 
no output from a software will ever determine where a marine reserve is, but they're starting points for the uh, robust negotiations that ensue and follow uh, afterwards. It's free. Intellectual property is theft. Whenever the University of Queensland try to make, make the into into intellectual property agreements, I always just I sign everything and then I say intellectual property is theft. Who claims to own an idea? Completely and thoroughly obnoxious concept. I say that now. Why? Because the only reason Mark San is the most widely used software in the world is we give it away for free. CSIRO three or four times invented stuff that was probably ten times better and ten times smaller than I could ever do. But they never wanted to give it away for free. They'd either sell it or say, we've got it. If you want to use it, then pay our consulting fees and we'll do it for you. So I think there's a lesson to us all there. If you give everything away for free, people who keep data, we, we, my lab keeps some, collects some data, all the data, the raw data goes up on the web. I do not believe that publicly funded people should have any Thing that they keep to themselves. Once you've done what you need to do with it, the software, everything, should all be free. I, I find it objectionable that we just continue to profit from the fact we were funded by the government. Anyway, and I think that's the reason why Mark's is successful, not no other reason. So if you're thinking of those things, then oh, and I do get 20 cents royalties if you buy one of those ridiculously expensive books, and that'll go into my research lab, not into my pocket. Okay. So conservation planning, I think, is actually quite mature. It's an incredibly mature part of conservation biology. One of the things that I think is incredibly immature is monitoring. Despite the fact we've probably been working on monitoring for longer, I argue at the moment that our notion about monitoring is somewhat flawed, largely because people think it's a statistical problem, but I think it's an optimization problem, and I believe there's economics in that problem. The bottom line is it costs money to monitor. And if you design monitoring programs and you don't think about money, and different costs of different sorts of mistakes in interpreting that data, you're not optimising your monitoring design. And that's been done about 10 times in the world, as far as I've heard. Nobody ever does it, nobody thinks of it that way. And I'll try and explain why. The first thing is you want to monitor something, is you have to have an objective, because you can't maximise nothing. You can't maximise something that you've never stated. And so we, in the paper, have just tried to clarify what is monitoring for? So many times people look at this monitoring program that's been running for 15 years and somebody says, well, and what were, you, what, what were we doing? You know, people come in from the forest and they say, oh, I've been monitoring this frog for 15 years and it's extinct. <laughs> right, well, maybe you should have told somebody. Or was there anything, <laughs> re any reason that you didn't do something? And they say, oh, I didn't think of that. You know, we monitor so many things to death. What are we doing it for? So the best sort of monitoring, I think, is state-dependent monitoring that says when this thing I'm counting reaches a level, I will change my actions. Or I will, that's a good thing to do. Auditing, sometimes monitoring is auditing. Have people promise to do what they say? Another form of monitoring that's very useful, and Donna briefly mentioned, active adaptive management. We can monitor different management activities and learn from them. But true active adaptive management has actually formally been done about a half a dozen times in the entire planet. Actually optimising your learning while you're doing. It's an extremely difficult thing to do. People say they're doing active adaptive management and they're actually doing passive adaptive management. Well, they aren't optimising their active, active adaptive management, even though that concept's been around for 25 years. And there's other reasons to monitor. Sometimes, and I think a lot of monitoring falls into this case in coral reefs, is we're just trying to convince people there is a serious problem. But how much do you need? I mean, maybe if you said, look, Bob and Bill, they've been down to the reef and, uh, and they think the reef's stuffed and they're going to take some pictures of it, maybe that's all you need to convince a, 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 a minister for the environment that the reef's stuffed. Maybe not. How much data do we really need to convince everybody? The public, ministers, politicians, Wilson Tucky. How much data do we need to convince these people that things are bad? Maybe we don't need as much as we've got. Maybe we need more. But until you know your objective, nobody's quantified the impact of different data quality on the belief systems of politicians. That's the study that has to happen. Nobody's done it. And finally, of course, we sometimes just monitor things because it's relatively cheap to do it and something may happen. Like somebody decides to monitor their CO2 in the atmosphere for a long, long time and we discovered that was quite a useful thing to have known for a long, long time. So some cheap things are worth monitoring for a long time. What, are you, what happens when you talk to a statistician? 
Well, they'll say, what level of statistical power do you want? So you can spend more money, we've got two different strategies, and they might say, here's some predetermined level of statistical power that we want. You know, we want to be 80% sure we reject a false null hypothesis. So we want that level. To give me the monitoring strategy that gives me that for the cheapest budget. That's one, of, one way of looking at it. Assuming that alpha type 1 error is at 5%. Why 5%? I have no idea. We'll look at that in a second. The other thing is people say, give me the most power for a fixed budget and pick the monitoring strategy. In this case, it would be the blue strategy. So that's traditional stuff that you will get from optimal monitoring people. And I think it's wrong because of something that Bruce Mapstone said in about 15 years ago, that the, cons the idea that you keep type 1 errors at 5% and then try and minimise, maximise your statistical power is completely flawed. It might be good for pure science, and we've all done that, we all did our honours thesis, okay, or well, some of us did our honours thesis, some of us don't want to remember it, but we all did it and had statistical power ran down our throat and said type 1 errors must be 5%, alpha is 5%. That's rubbish. Okay, what is a type 1 error? A type 1 error means that we actually said something was going bad, so somebody's throwing something to the reef and we failed to detect. No, type 1 error. This is where I always get confused. A type 1 error is somebody's throwing something to the reef and we say it's bad for the reef, but it wasn't. So we stopped a bad activity. Type 2 error is somebody's doing something bad to the reef, whatever it is, and we fail to detect it, and it is bad. And if you know the costs of those two things, then you should weight the size of those errors by their cost. And in fact, if the cost of a type 2 error, which is not acting when something's going bad, is much bigger than the cost of a type 1 error, you should make your type 2 error that much smaller. Uh, Bruce, I think, decided we should equalise them. We believe that this is the way to choose appropriate statistical tests and get your type 1 and type 2 errors correct. And basically, sometimes you should allow alphas of 50% and you know, should allow huge type 1 errors that we often falsely reject a null hypothesis. We're not trying to prove what's right in the world. We're trying to work out how to take an action that optimises societal benefits. And that is a completely different... Pure science and applied sciences are completely different on this issue. And they should not be confused, and they are continually confused. So I urge you to reach, read his, is it 1995 paper? I can't remember, something like that, about this issue, and read some of our more recent papers. And we've, we've just sort of had some colour and light to that, that he thought of that a long time ago. And then the second question is, if you spend money monitoring, you could have done something else with that money. How much monitoring should you do? Maybe you should do none. You know, I think in a lot of cases we shouldn't do any monitoring. In fact, I can guarantee you we're not monitoring lots of things. We do not monitor everything in the world. We don't monitor all the things we haven't got a name for. We don't no monitor all the chemicals we don't know what they do. So actually 99.999% of the planet's unmonitored. So the question is then, with the small amount of money we have got for monitoring, what things should we monitor and what things shouldn't we monitor? In our view, in some senses, if that monitoring is there to improve management and you're thinking very applied, then we should be able to draw up diagrams like this. And what does this mean? Oh, what does it mean? It means nothing. Um, what it means is that this is the amount of your entire budget you spend on monitoring. This is Skrabumpa's budget on monitoring. And this is the amount of your budget that you spend on management. Well, if you spend 100% of your budget, budget monitoring things, you won't do anything. If you spend none of your budget monitoring anything, you don't know if anything you've done is good, and you may manage quite badly. So we'll assume that this purple line is how well you manage. And we'll assume if you never look, you won't manage very well. And as you look and you learn and you monitor more, you'll make more efficient management decisions. And in fact, when, how much money do you spend on monitoring? That's when the per dollar gain, the return on investment for more monitoring, the gains of efficiency are matched by the losses in the fact that you are not spending money on management. So in theory, the product of the blue and the uh, red curves is that, and that's your expected gain from, uh, that's your final outcome, and that should tell you that is how much you should monitor. And we virtually never do that. We could do that for anything. If you believe that you're monitoring to make better decisions 
And that could be to make better decisions about the state of systems and implement actions or it could be better learning and understanding of the system itself. We don't have this graph and we need it until we get that graph for systems, we will never optimise our spending on monitoring. We may be being too, doing too much, we may be doing too little, but we haven't actually even posed the problem. Oh, lots of rubbish there. You can read it. What do I really want to say? I think I've said most of those things. I mean, this is the one that actually intrigues me most at the moment and gets back, you know, if we're partly monitoring the reef to inform the public, who will then inform the politicians that something's really bad, how much data do we need? You know, do we just need a few pictures of a bleached reef? Do we need a few pictures of a fish trap somewhere in the Caribbean and nothing and sea urchins? Is that all we need? How many, or do we need really rigorous data? Because once you go through to policy, they'll say, where's your evidence? And they want better evidence. And then we'll have people who will deny that our evidence is accurate and then we'll go into a fight. But ultimately, there's diminishing returns to getting better and better data and better, better knowledge. What is that? Have we ever worked out what that is? Have we ever done an analysis of discussions about science and seen when has science fallen over because the data was weak, too weak for us to prove there was a problem with a threatened species or a habitat or a threat? We've not done it. We need some social scientists. I'm sure there's two or three somewhere in Queensland. And we've written a lot about this, but we haven't solved many of the big problems. We've solved little problems. We've asked questions like, if you collapse a fish stock, how long should you, work, how long should you spend working out its parameters before you build a reserve? That's that first paper in the College of Weathers. Um, a whole heap of things. How much data do you need for a reserve system? Should we wait till we've found every single species of fish in its distribution off the Kimberleys before we build a reserve system? Obviously not. But at the moment we have very little data on biodiversity off the Kimberleys. How much data do we need before we're likely to make a mistake? A lot of what we do also... So, I, 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 I'll finish the monitoring stuff by saying every time somebody talks about monitoring, ask the question is, what were you trying to do? What is your objective? Can you quantify it? And if you did more monitoring, was it worth it compared to what you could have spent the money on? You have to be deeply cynical, because I would argue that sometimes scientists encourage monitoring so they can get data, so they can write a paper. Okay. Even though this money is meant to be to make a difference for application. No, no, that would never have happened. Ridiculous concepts. I shouldn't have said that. A lot of what we do in the lab, stuff on the coral triangle now, is really quite simple optimization. If you want to see a good example of simple science and economics and decision science being applied to do cost effectiveness analysis, have a look at that paper. And we're doing similar sorts of things all around the world on terrestrial things in the coral triangle. How does government do return on investments analysis to get the biggest bang for their buck? And I won't talk more about that, but it's quite straightforward from an economic perspective and it can be applied to any large-scale allocational policy problem. And we're working on marine systems as well as terrestrial systems. And basically, who does all this? I do nothing. These people do all the work. Uh, these people write papers for me and they sometimes put my name at the back of the paper because I did nothing. Um, and somebody pays for it all, and the Australian Research Council pay for a lot, but also we have a Commonwealth Environmental Research Facility grant that supports AIDA, Applied Environmental Decision Analysis. It's a surf. I have no ideas whether surfs will live or die. Uh, uh, we may get refunded. The whole program may stop. But I think it's been a good initiative. Uh, it's been an initiative that's actually helped to get science and policy together, and uh, it will be interesting to see if it survives. And uh, I'll leave you with some questions for me. Five idiotic questions. So uh, I've given, you know, I've given 180 talks about why we should use decision theory and decision science to solve conservation problems, and I've assembled the common questions, and I'm sick of answering them. So if, if you, one of those is your question, I'm happy to answer it now, or I decided to write them all up. And you can read a thing called Decision Point, which we put out every month, and comes out every month, it's up on the web, it's called Decision Points, it's run by our centre, if you Google AIDA you can find it, and in one of those editorials is my five uh, 
answers to those questions. But if you may have some better...